Okay, let me see if I can uh, grab my uh, my special guest. We uh, we're trying to find uh, Greg Wilson. He's actually uh, in New York right now, and he is um, actually about to go on stage in a few minutes. And maybe he's on the phone call with us. Greg, are you there? Yes, I am, sir. Can you hear me okay? I can, and I can adjust your volume if not. How are you? Thanks for joining the call. Oh, hey, no problem. Happy to be here. Well, I know you're probably going to step on stage soon and do and uh, shake your money thing, as they say. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, that is the only thing they pay me for. You know, they're not paying me for my looks. <laughs> you know, you're funny because so. you're very self-deprecating. <laughs> no, I'm just real. I'm very honest. And, you know, the other thing is when you make fun of yourself first, it makes it a lot easier to make fun of other people. Oh, then it's like permission. If I make fun of me, I can make fun of you in the front row. Exactly. Shut up it and sort of makes drink. it all the same. Like, look, it's all the same. I make fun of me. I make fun of you. Come on. That's, that's really funny. Uh, so let me yeah. say that this is, a, this is, of course, a handwriting call, but it's not only about handwriting. I mean, people get into graphology because they dig people, and they're curious right. about people and, like, why they think and why they're successful. And one of the reasons I want you on the phone is I, I can't think of anybody that's more an expert in being funny. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I think that's probably that's probably true. I mean, and that's, that's, <laughs> well, you're funny, but you also have 20 years of being funny professionally, so it's not like an arrogant thing to say. I mean, you know funny because no, you've that, studied that is it. Actually, that is actually true, and it's something I talk about in my – it's the reason I started teaching my workshop, because I'm one of the few comedians that's actually uh, toured professionally, both do, uh, doing all three major disciplines of comedy, troupe improv, troupe sketch, and individual stand-up. And so – uh, it, it's a, it, because the two lend themselves well to stand up. Stand up does not lend itself well at all to the other two. And so they're three very different disciplines, but they all kind of come together. In, well, in well let me ask you about that. And, and we will definitely get to your handwriting because I know you love to talk about yourself, but there's really nothing bad, so don't stress about it. <laughs> I'm thinking about, like, what does it say? Because I, I swear to God, I'm not going to, I'm not going to create another Holocaust, I swear. <laughs> But but, there's, <laughs> but here's the question. One of the things I have, I have, I'm not very good at predicting from somebody's handwriting is if they're going to be funny or not. Like, okay. like what is humor? Because it's a very subjective thing across cultures, and there is like one trait that says sense of humor. You know, but, but you have not only known hundreds of comedians and aspiring comedians. I mean, how do you define humor, and how do you know if someone's funny or not? Well, you know, it's it, it's it's interesting you say that. There's most people don't ever bother to look up the definition of a joke, but if you look at the definition of a joke, it pretty much it gives you a very nice, simple, clean definition, which is anything said or done that causes laughter or provokes amusement. Uh, so, I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, if you're if someone's amused by it, well, then you've created humor. You know. Uh, there are, of course, that's the thing, there are all those, these opinions about what it should be, but the reality is, is that anything that succeeds in creating laughter or amusement has done its job of being funny, of being a joke. So, so let, let me, let me give a proper introduction. The, the Greg Wilson is who's on the phone, and Greg, your website is thegregwilson.tv, right? Yes, that's it. Yes. Okay, and, and they don't they don't know you. They've probably seen you on TV, and then because every time I'm with you, people say I recognize you from TV. So you're yeah, not a it's big always star. Weird. But... It isn't like I, I'm not at that level of fame where people know my name exactly. It's really more like they remember seeing me, but they don't know where. And oftentimes they think I'm one of their friends. So I want to tell me like, how do we? Uh, do you know Bobby? You're a friend of Bobby's, right? You know, but it tends to be uh, or that VH1 guy. Or what have I seen you on? Yeah, that's so. that. That I think, and, and if you've done the IMDb search, if you've done lots of movies, you you've been a writer on on a very popular. Uh, is it a show with Byron Allen? Is that the writing gig you've had? Yes, yes, Comics Unleashed with Byron Allen. Yeah, and, and of course you've been on stage and specials, but I think they recognize you most from the VH1 specials, right? Well, the VH1 stuff, I mean, it, it, it's the most recognizable because they just ran the crap out of it for so long, you know, that it just, it, I mean, I, that was what I obviously got my most exposure from. Was but, but, and, and just, you were the guy, like Greg Wilson, comedian, making funny comments about celebrities. Yeah, I would always, yeah, and, and the funny thing about that was is there were some people that were always worried about backlash from that t type of thing. One time, uh, Charlie Murphy came up to me and he goes, Greg, you know, you're not worried about ever meeting these people. <laughs> and, I mean, I thought, well, if I'm meeting them, then I'm doing something right. So, <laughs> you know, I'll take it. Awesome. So, so question, you are an, a student of funny. You've done, you've done um, stand-up, which is a very, very difficult art. art. And yeah, then you I think it's the most difficult. You think it's yeah. the most difficult? 
Well, and you know, if, you know, the funny thing about it is if you ever spend any time around lawyers who have had to be around through various relationships, um, lawyers are, are definitely convinced they are the smartest people in the world. <laughs> and okay. No, absolutely. But the one job they, they maybe couldn't do, they're not sure, or they're really they doubt they could even do it, is stand-up. It's the oddest thing. It's the only thing that they really kind of have to, like, you know, acquiesce to. Like, well, yeah, I guess I couldn't do it. It's, it's, it's really weird. <laughs> like, we're brilliant. We're, we're God's gifts. But I can't do what you do. Exactly. That's exactly right. And it's an odd dynamic to be around. Yeah. You know, but I recognize it, and, of course, I milk it for everything. Now, now, one of the people that we're, we're analyzing in today's call is Zach Galanafikas. Did I say his name right? No, you didn't. It's Galifianakis. Yeah. Okay. I'm such a <laughs> dork. If, now, if I ever want to do it, like, I can finish your name. You are the first, I assure you. Um, he, he's been around the comedy scene for a long time, and he's finally long now time. famous as an actor. Is that about right? Yeah. Yes. And I don't know, do you know him personally? I mean, do you know of him as a as a? I've worked with him, like, twice in New York. We were on the same show, but really we don't... I mean, I'd be surprised if you remember my name. I mean, that's but because what's interesting about him is he's a great comic actor. We saw his yeah. handwriting. He's sarcastic. He's funny. He's a little belligerent, a little domineering. Like, I wouldn't perceive him as just a joyous to be in a relationship with, but we love him on TV and movies, right? Right. Like, what's the difference between him being hilarious on TV and him being your friend? Is he funny all the time as your friend, or will we not make a good stand-up comic? What are the distinctions there? Well, you know, it's a, you know, I always call it the Clark Kent and Superman syndrome, where a lot of comics are Superman on stage, Superman when they're performing, and total Clark Kent otherwise, you know, uh, and that happens a lot. There's a lot of guys that are just a completely different person on stage because that's the person they want to be is the person on stage. And, and they it rehearse a, that, and they practice and then they, it. Yeah, well, they write around it. They create it around the idea of being that persona, you know, um, and I would say he is a lot like that in many ways, but from the few times I've been around him, that's what it seemed like. I mean, he seemed much more reserved off stage than he was on stage, even though it was a, a somewhat kind of reserved performance, but it would explode, you know. Uh, another com comedian is a guy named uh, Eric Schwartz, Sweetie Schwartz, and he does this whole rap act, you know, and it's it's hysterical and, and very, you know, and he's, you know, and, and very aggressive and assertive on stage and off stage. He is not that person at all, you know. Uh, he's, he's, he goes right back to being that nervous around girls nerd, you know, uh, the second he comes off stage. Is he the one that wears the hat all the time in the guitar? Mm, no. There's two, two Eric Schwartz around. Now, I think I've noticed about you is a lot of comedians are really funny on stage and they're quiet off stage. You generally are always on. Like, you're I'm just funny. I'm the exact same at all times. You're the always funny. You're always just... curious. You, you always <laughs> say the inappropriate thing because you want to get a laugh, whether you're having dinner with two people or you're in I front know. of a thousand. You know what's funny, too, is when I, I, I teach my class, I tell them, talk to the audience like they're one person because that's how you give off the aura of, of being comfortable on stage. You just talk to them like the one person instead of feeling like you have to do more because it's a thousand people. And one of my students was like, yeah, but Greg, you yell and scream all the time. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but I would do that to just one person. <laughs> you should ask my girlfriend. I'd like to see everybody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, to everyone. Hey, listen, I'm right now. I'm screaming my head I'm just highly excitable. There's no change whatsoever the number of people in front of me. And so uh, um, what was the point? Where were we going with that? Well, I, I was just saying that you're pretty much you on and oh, off Oh, yeah, stage. the only difference is I'm more consistent when I'm on stage. That's where you're going with that. Yeah. On and, stage, there's more consistency. It's more honed down well, to the actual craft. And, and one, of the, one of the crafts that, that we're learning here is to be able to predict people's personality, to know if they're going to be funny, et cetera. So let me point out a couple things in your writing, which I think correlate to your, your career. Uh -huh. and, and you tell me if they're true, if they're not true, and whether you think they really helped you become a, a kind of a comic master or whether it's something that um, other comics have or don't have. Okay. So the first thing is your signature is is very fluid. I mean, it kind of looks like a big figure eight, like one huge fast signature. That tends to be fluidity of thinking, go from topic to topic of one of the huge signals of intelligence and in my my uh, version, efficiency. And, and that's what it is. It's about efficiency, about making it just you know, <laughs> getting it done as fast as possible. I mean, you know. That's, well, I mean, well, I, I, I did 1,500 radio interviews, and about half of the hosts had this single trait, and it's not a common trait in most of the world. And so right. it's a writer, speaker, the ability to weave words and then come back and pick up where you left off, which I think is an essential skill for you. 
I think and that is an essential skill on to- on stage, rather. You know, I mean, it's what, I mean, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to build this overall connection with an audience and sort of have this short relationship with them for whatever time you're on stage. You know, and a lot of it, and a lot of it, uh, then ends up in what we call callbacks. You know, which is when we call back to the original joke at the very end of a totally separate joke, much later in the act. But without fluidity, you would forget where you were, and you wouldn't be able to dot that i. Well, without fluidity, you would never create those callbacks. It just wouldn't even come to mind. Interesting. Now, the second thing people might notice about your signature is it's very large, which which they'll think, ah, oh, he's a celebrity. But but I don't think just celebrities write large signatures. It is a sense of ego and self confidence. Do you think Possibly. that you have an ego, and is that important to be in the entertainment business, to have a good ego? Well, you know, and that's the thing is everyone complains about the ego in the entertainment business, but the problem with entertainment business is in the arts, trying to make a profession of the arts is what I'm going to say, um, is that you have to believe in you first, you know, before anyone else believes in you. Because there is a lot of setbacks, a lot of people telling you no, a lot of opinionation um, that gets in your way. And if you don't genuinely believe in yourself and your vision and what you're doing, uh, then you then you will quit immediately. Then you will be like, yeah, I guess this isn't for me. I must have been wrong, and that that'll be that. You know, I mean, in the earlier parts of my career, everyone kept saying, Greg, you can't be dirty, you can't be dirty. And, I, and all I could think was, but that's, I love dirty jokes. If it's me, that's you know? what I like to I'm talk not about. doing dirty jokes because it's easy. That's the way, everyone always thought it was being easy. And I guess that's why I decided to try and make them so structurally perfect, you couldn't write them off as just being easy. You had to admit there was mastery of craft in them. And... Because it's what I wanted to do. It upset me that everyone discounted it as just cheating. I was This is what I like to do. I happen to work in this art form. You know, this is you know this is uh, my palette. You know, if you will. These are the colors I choose to use. This is what I like. And I hated that people told me I couldn't do it, but I believed in it constantly. You know, and so when I got my first television opportunity, they you know, I mean, the one joke everyone had told me to stop doing. The producer was like, I don't care what you do as long as you close with that joke. You know. <laughs> I got a standing ovation, and that's what it was about. It was about, and, and so there, is, there has to be ego involved. You have to believe you're good enough to do it. You have to really believe that you're bet, you have the potential to be the best. And I think that's ego, and I think a good ego is wonderful. I think it, it is, and the thing ego. is, it can't draw you away from from reality either. I mean, right. and that's why I do have this self deprecating jokes. That's why I do under, because I mean, you got to be able to turn the mirror on yourself, you know, turn the gun on yourself, rather, you know, and you know. You got to be able to see it, see it clearly for what it is. And so I mean, but you do have to have a healthy. And I think that is the difference between having a healthy ego and just being an egomaniac. Right, and and I see strong ego. And you opened for ten years with with a joke about how you looked. Yes, about looking like a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> And never like, oh yeah, he does tell her you're a lesbian. That's pretty funny. Never, the joke never not worked. It was it was what I what I call a hundred percenter. Nice. It worked. Uh, I mean, as close to a hundred percent as you're going to get. Obviously, there's no true hundred percenter, but I mean, ninety nine point nine five percent of the time that joke works. That's funny. You know, the, I, I didn't do near as much stand up as you have, and the few times I was on stage and I, and it worked out well, uh, which I think was more than not. It, I opened opened with a joke like Larry Bird and Sean Penn had a baby. Right, and and they looked at that because neither one of those are good-looking guys, and they were like, "Oh, that's totally right." It is. And it's totally true, and that's what is. That's why it works because it's based on the truth. And they liked it because I'm making fun of myself, and it let everyone down. And then it was like, "Hey, he can make fun of himself." Yeah, but I'm also an egomaniacal, you know, star like you are. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, I did some research on the NBA players, and one of the only traits that they could predict accurately from to make an NBA player from college was his ego. The, the the ones with the massive unbottled ego are the ones that made it in the NBA. Yeah, and the and only, it's kind only of a five guys in- too, because you walk around with everyone having these huge egos without having the skills, determination, and work ethic to back it up. You know, because they do, because they see that come out so much. They're like, oh, we well, got to believe, got to say it. You know, it's like, well, you also got to work for it constantly. Right. You know, we'll, and that's what kind that. of gets lost in the confidence ego game. Because because comedy is not – there are a lot of naturally funny people, and, I, and you've probably done this more than anybody. You've seen people all over the country in Arkansas and Texas like, oh, I could do that. I could be funny like him. How much work does it take to be as funny as you are for 45 minutes in a row? Uh, so much more work than you could ever possibly imagine from sitting on your couch watching it on TV and being a funny person around your friends. You really couldn't ever imagine it would be this incredible mountain, uh, you know, it would be crossing the Himalayas to get to on foot without a guy. 
<laughs> I watched a documentary of Joan Rivers, and Joan Rivers is 70-something, right? She still has a Rolodex and filing cabinets of jokes by every topic. Exactly. And she I still mean, writes I mean, jokes I mean, every what, day. The skills – well, and also she has a fear of ever losing it, which most comedians do. Most comedians fear losing the one success they achieve because the road up is so hard and you're so poor and it goes on for so long. <laughs> that, you know, if there's one trait that would benefit anybody that would want to make a career in the arts, it's the ability to be comfortable with poverty. That is really the, – the, that really is the difference maker between those that make it all the way through and those that end up quitting at some point is your ability to, to be comfortable and be broke. Because especially um, even – especially stand-up comedy for sure. It's so hard to get stage time in any major city. And then, of course, in sitcoms and acting, I mean, what do you do? You work for free in improv troops around the world, right? Yeah. I mean, they don't pay you much for doing improv. I mean, maybe Second City, you get 20 bucks, right? Well, you don't work for free. Well, the way I did it, you don't work for free. We actually made pretty good money on it, but we were a very successful troupe. So we had a lot of college gigs, road tours, all that kind of but stuff. But you could have taken a six-figure insurance job and sold insurance and made a lot more money. Absolutely. I undoubtedly could have made three. You know, it's funny. I remember there was a very specific point in my life where I saw I had started a company, and it was doing well. We had just landed some big deals. Um Right out of the gate. I mean, this is in the first, you know, uh, you know, I made a $90,000 deal, $100,000 deal. I had these big deals working in the first year of my company, and I, I was like, and I saw it, and I was like, well, this is it. This is it. This is it. I either go this way with this company, grow my business, make the money, marry the girl, buy the house, have the car, and watch comedians on TV, or I dump this, and I go that way. And it was, I mean, it was a black and white moment in my life. I remember this thing. I remember sitting at my desk and looking at my files and thinking, I promised myself I wouldn't do this. And that was the day I decided to quit. Quit, quit the job, and, and you didn't settle, and you went for the artistic route. Yes. And to do what you've done now, and, and, and let me just tell you, if you haven't seen Greg on stage, I've, I've seen you follow – Dane Cook, Drew Carey, George Lopez. I've seen you follow these guys at midnight, right, when the audience is tired and a little drunk, and you are twice as good. You get twice as many laughs. You hold them in their seats until 2 o'clock in the morning, right? Yeah, and it takes the yeah, – that's hard work too, man. <laughs> You're brilliant. I mean, I'm telling you, even if you don't love dark – I mean, I saw the college girls that you could, you could tell had never had a drink of alcohol peeing in their pants at a poop joke. I mean, you really know how to run an audience across all cultures and all ages, and it, and it, it has really taken you, what, 20 years of, of discipline and research and skill and practice? Yes, absolutely. 20 years, 22 years. 22 years. And I mean, all of it, and it, all of it is a culmination in what I do now. What I do now is a culmination of all that work because what, it, what makes it possible for me to do those things is mixing in the improv uh, and the sketch work with the material, you know? And that kind of keeps them on their toes. I go back to the audience, work them a little bit, get them back interested, and then I let them off the hook with doing, going back to the material. So, I mean, it's this back and forth that kind of keeps, you know, it's, that kind of keeps, them, keeps them alive. So, so do you cooking. think a, a sketch, a comedian, or a stand-up comedian, who's funnier just sitting around with three friends? It's really up to the person again. I mean, some guys are, are some guys are far more brilliant off stage than they are on stage, and I always feel sorry for those guys <laughs> because I'm like, how do you trans? You need to just be that guy on stage. Quit doing these jokes you think you wrote and just do that, you know. And, and it's it's weird. It's it's tough because some of them are just fucking hilarious off stage and just suck on stage. They just can't pull it off. They um, just don't have it. Two more things about your handwriting, and then I know, I know you're off to be on stage, uh, and you can talk as long as you want because we love having you here. The M's and N's show your brilliance, fast thinking, and shall, shall, shall I say impatience with stupid people. <laughs> <laughs> wow, nothing could be more correct. Now, I see that in, 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 in Donald Trump has it. He's not funny. He's just brilliant. He's fast thinking. But the impatience is this fat, the ability to sort of finish someone's sentences before they even finish it. Is the speed of thinking something that's helped you or harmed you or, or helped you? I think, I mean, for what I do for being a comedian, it's been an absolute asset. I mean, that's where the whole, you know, the crowd work interactive part of the show comes from is just – you know, just reading them very quickly. I actually teach a crowd work class in addition to my regular class. And the crowd work class is about reading the audience. And you have to, because see, the process is very quick. You have the amount of time between you go, look at this, 
Now, you that look at this. You have three words to think of what you think of it, to analyze the person you're looking at, to break them down, and to find a punchline to communicate that thought without being a dick. Without being a dick. That's the challenge. And that's the, that's the difference between being a dick and being a comedian is creating the punchline. Okay, so what we do in handwriting, you do in, in like – Two seconds, unconsciously, in front of 500 people, you pick out three words, and then you're like, i got to say something funny about this dopey girl from Alaska or whatever. Yes. You give me an example. Like, like you pick somebody, because, is it because they're heckling you or because you're just trying to interact well, because with the crowd? They, they, no, because they fed something to me. There's something about their appearance, demeanor, or something that told me something about them that to me is incredibly obvious. You know? Like so now I have to or... talk about it. Now I'm going to talk about it. You know? <laughs> People make a lot of statements with their clothes and their hair and their glasses and their appearance and the people they choose to surround themselves with and the way they, they express themselves during the show. And then I just take those pieces of information and create a punchline out of it. And they love and it or, or they hate very it. Quickly. <laughs> and they do, well, the, that, see, that's the difference. If you create a punchline, they can't help but love it because at least you created a punchline. If you just say something dicky, then they have no reason to like you. So it's got to be if funny. You're cl- if you're clever about it, there's a part of them, regardless of the res- of the of their expense, that respects the moment, that respects the fact that I came up with something. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, you know, here's something that they'll probably ask about your handwriting is because your see, Greg, Will, you kind of scratch out the middle. See, the Wilson goes back through your signature, right? Yes. Is that a, a T? Is that crossing something? What, what does that stroke for? No, uh, well, originally, the, and I gave you my legal signature and my showbiz signature. Okay. Because the, the only difference is that I put a T first and then write the rest oh, that's with smart. the showbiz signature. That's it. The legal signature, it's really was just, I felt like the important letters here are G and W. The rest is irrelevant to me. Right. You know, G and W, that tells you it is. So it's really just G, W, and then just a line that, that is supposed to be Reg Ilson. <laughs> you know, because it's a signature. Now, let me say, why, why don't you underline? Because one of the things in, in, in the, the, the books on handwriting is if they cross their name out, it's sort of a self-deprecating or self-castigating trait. Like I'm building a, a quick sand, I'm building some sand, and then I'm crashing it down. Does that apply to you, or because you've, you've developed this fast signature, that does not apply to you? I don't think that applies in this case. It re- for me, it really was just a matter of efficiency. Okay, efficiency you know? and power and punctuation. And, and to me, it was making it part of the name, not less than the name. It was making it part of the name. It's Greg Wilson, but the only letters that really count to me are the G and the W, so the rest is right there in the middle. <laughs> I see. I'm just going to put the E-G right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, right exactly. The rest, the rest is right in the middle. There you go. Right there where you can see it. You know it's a signature, but G and W, that's the only part you need to really need. That's very funny. That's very, very funny. Um, okay, I, you know what, Greg? Is there anything you could share about? And finally, I know you want to. You got to run because they're waiting for you on stage. Is 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 there anything you share about about how to be funnier? I mean, do, do we need to just like? I know you got some DVDs, right? I mean, is there an art? Can we all learn to be funny, or is you born with it? Well, you can only put so much polish on a turd. <laughs> so <laughs> I can structure you up all day, but if you're not funny, you're still not funny. I mean, and there's there's one part where I, that I talk about in my DVD where I say, you know, if a joke works, it just works. You know, you can take all this structure, you can take all these definitions and everything that I teach you, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and if it does work, it just works. You know, and and that's a really indefinable, indes- you know, uh, in, indescribable part of comedy. There's nothing I can do to teach you how to be that part of funny. Funny just is, and it just happens, and some people have a knack for it and some don't. But, you know, and that's what frustrates, I think, most people about stand-up is great comedy just doesn't happen every day. It takes years to accumulate great comedy. I was talking with Ron White, and he goes, Greg, it took me 18 years to write my first hour. It took me 18 months to write my second. You know? (laughs) You know, that's just the challenge of comedy, you know. But, I mean, I certainly can't take what you do and make it operate a million times better. I can take what the, the crap that, you know, you're, you have all over the place right now and just kind of shape it up and make it operate like, like professional grade stand-up, you know. That's what my workshop is about is joke structure, punchline creation, et cetera, et cetera. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I've always wanted to learn more about what you do. In tra- I mean, I get, I get the luxury of spending some time with you here and there, but most people don't. If they want to learn from it, is there a website or anybody they can go to, to get your DVDs? And have yeah, you they can go to my website, thegregwolf.tv, and if you're, if you're in a hurry, just slash workshops. 
it'll take you right to the page. And uh, although I think it's on the front page, it's the DVD. If you want the DVD, it's on the front page. Just go to the Greg Wilson TV, and the DVD it just came out last month, and uh, and uh, you can just you can watch it and learn at home. Because because some people are too egotistical to actually go and sign up and take the class. Um, <laughs> you know, can I tell you it's been purchased? Uh, you know, I see who purchases it. A lot of times it's somebody that's a veteran comedian that would never want to come to the work. They couldn't let people see them at the workshop, but you know they kind of want to know. They want to know how do you do what you do? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so it's kind of funny when I see the name. So it's it's fun. I enjoy it. Well, gosh, hey, Greg, thank you so much for the time you spent with us, and I hope everyone buys your DVDs, and, and I hope that everyone can see you live one time. You're, you're sort of like a Cirque du Soleil. Once they've seen you once, you just can't get it out of your head. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it. Okay, buddy. Have a great show. Bye now. Take care. I will. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.